My name is Thomas Sir, CEO of Connections. Welcome everyone to Connections webcast on an inside view of the European regulatory framework presented by Professor Bart van der Schoen of the University of Leuven, Belgian representative to the European Medicines Agency. I want to go over a couple of housekeeping details first. Uh, first, while you are listening to the presentation, please place your microphones on mute so we can optimize the sound quality for everyone. Second, if you're only calling in, but you have a chance to log in via the internet, I would urge you to log in so you can see the slides that Bart will be sharing and talking to. Third, a recording and slides will be posted on our Connexum website at uh, in the in the near future. And finally, if you have questions, please enter them in the chat function of the Uber conference platform that we're using. You can open up the cartoon comment bubble icon in the right column of your screen, and Bart will address them at the end of, the, of his prepared remarks to the extent possible. Uh, so uh, without further ado, Bart, uh, if uh, actually I should have done a better job of uh, of introducing you, perhaps you could open up, take the mic, and uh, introduce yourself a little bit further, and then uh, we look forward to your remarks. Yeah. So first of all, I I would like to make sure that everybody can see the slides. Yes, I can see them. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. So uh, I am um, Bart van der Schuur. I'm indeed uh, an endocrinologist at the University Hospital in Leuven, Belgium, but I'm also a clinical pharmacologist and um, I'm the representative for Belgium at uh, the CHMP. And this is um, what I want to talk about, uh, the insights I have into the European regulatory system that I have been involved in now for about, well, since 2011, so for about um, seven uh, years. Now, um, it's a very high level view. I just want to give an overview and then how I'm going to go shortly from time to time into the fact of how it differs from uh, maybe the Food and Drug Administration in the US. But we can uh, definitely talk about that more um, at the end of uh, my presentation. I'll, I'll leave time for that. So, first of all, yeah, I have no conflicts of interest with industry, obviously, as I'm working for. Um, the uh, European Medicine Agency. And so I am the Belgian member of the Committee for Medicinal Products for Human Use at EMA. I'm also a member of the Cardiovascular Working Party. Uh, and this is because I, I'm very interested in diabetes and thus um, that um, is viewed as a kind of um, vascular disease. I also want to disclaim these talks. I'm going to give some personal views, uh, but the views expressed in this presentation um, or not to be understood or quoted as being made on behalf or reflecting the position of the European Medicine Agency or one of its committees or working parties. So first, um, I'll go into um, what exactly, how medicinal products are regulated within Europe and how this uh, idea of centralizing the regulations of uh, marketing authorizations for medicinal products came in place. Then I'll give you um, some of my experiences and <laughs> some of my frustrations within the European system. And then I'll go into the strengths and the, the weaknesses um, of the, the current system um, that we have. Now, um, what is the European Medicine Agency? The European Medicine Agency was founded in 1995 uh, by the European Commission. And the idea was that it was better to centralize marketing authorizations for medicinal products within the European Union. The European Union at, at that time was way smaller, but now consists of 28 member states. And luckily, we are losing one of the main member states. The UK will be leaving in March 2019. And the UK is also the home of the European Medicine Agency office. So we are moving along and we're moving to the Netherlands in March 2019. So, um, what does it do? And this is a bit in contrast already with the FDA. It regulates um, the uh, marketing authorization for uh, medicinal products for 510 million people living in the European Union. That's at the same time its strength that it has a, a access to a huge market. Um, 
20% of global sales of medicine happens in that market. But so um, what was the role and why was EMA created in 95? It was to um, evaluate applications for marketing authorizations. I'll come back to that because not all medicinal products are forced to use this centralized way of um, gaining access to the European market. You can still opt uh, for some medicinal products to go through national competent uh, authorities, so national agencies. So this is very important that you understand EMA as trying to centralize something that was decentralized before, but it's still way less centralized than FDA. The other role it has was to facilitate development and access to medicines. And then one of the, the key roles is also to monitor the safety of medicines across their life cycle uh, when, while they are being used uh, in the European Union and provide reliable information um, on human and, and veter veterinary medicines to patients and healthcare professionals. So that's its major um, role and that's the role, the mandate it got from the European um, Commission. Now, uh, as I told you, so it was established in 95. Meanwhile, there's um, approximately 1,000 staff members that work in the agency in the London office. And uh, it has uh, seven scientific committees. I'll come back to that later. Um, it's, um, uh, I'll come back to the committees um, later. I think it's going to be better. So this is the current building on the next slide in, in Canary Wharf that we will unfortunately be leaving. We actually just moved there two years ago, so it's a bit um, unfortunate, but well, let's not linger on that. And this is kind of the structure um, of the European Medicine Agency, and there you can already see its complexity. So it's, it's composed of several committees. Um, within the committee, there was also working parties. Um, the main committee for human medicinal products is the CHMP, of where I represent Belgium. And it's the CHMP that is finally going to give an opinion to the European Commission or, or other, on whether a marketing authorization uh, of a medicinal product should be approved or not, should be granted or not. So what is important to understand is that um, this uh, committee is composed of members such as me, often people that are working for national, national agencies, but in my case, I'm, I'm mostly working within the university hospital, and this is kind of um, a side activity for me. Um, but so that it's not really, um, we don't work with areas of expertise that the CHMP, the Committee for uh, Medicinal Products for Human Use, sees all products passing by and so we will vote uh, on some of these products uh, on whether marketing authorization should be granted or not but it means that I as an endocrinologist am also voting on drugs that uh, are not at all within my comfort zone or within my field but I can rely on my national agency to kind of advise me on uh, what position um, to take but I'll come back to that. The other uh, committees I'm, I'm going to talk about less, the main committee is CHMP. This is not because I'm in it, but this is the committee that, that grants marketing authorization and that most companies uh, come in contact with. The COMP is another important one. It, it grants the orphan status and, and the smart marketing exclusivity. Um, the PRAC is the committee that uh, looks at uh, pharmacovigilant uh, risk assessment um, and so that, that does the, pharma, the, the post marketing phase of the of the cycle. The GET is the one responsible for advanced therapy. CVMP is the one for veterinary and the PETCO is the pediatric committee. This next slide I'm going to skip and I'm going to go to the European Medi Medicines Regulatory Network. So what needs to be really understood is that we still have 50 national regulatory authorities. So some member states have more than one regulatory authority depending on what kind of uh, medicinal product you're talking about. Um, so there's, these are still in place. The European Medicine Agency is kind of trying to centralize this. And the European Medicine Agency is, what it is doing is advising the European Commission that is responsible for trade within the EU uh, on um, what should be done uh, in regard to uh, medicinal products. So in the end, the end, 
uh, responsibility remains with the European Commission and the European Medicine Agency should kind of be seen as giving advice to the European Commission um, thanks to its scientific uh, committees. On the next slide, you can see that there are still possibilities of going uh, decentralized. So a company can choose to go for national procedures via, via the national competent authorities. But there are some products, next slide, on which this cannot be done anymore. So there are some products for which all member states have agreed that if you want to file for marketing authorizations for drugs in the field of HIV, cancer, diabetes, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, autoimmune and other immune dysfunction diseases and viral diseases, then you need to go through the centralized uh, procedures. And then you, you, you need to take this one stop at the, and then you get marketing authorizations for all member states. This is also the case for uh, medicinal products that are derived from biotechnological processes, advanced therapy medicines, and orphan medicines. The veteran medicines I'm not going to talk about um, today. Other products can, can take the, no, the non-centralized road, can just apply in every member state uh, separately, but a lot of... Um, Companies will not choose that road because obviously it's more lengthy if you have to apply uh, state by state. And so even products that uh, could go in a decentralized procedure often opt to uh, take the centralized um, um, procedure. And why is this? Because obviously, and that's on the next slide, it is way easier because your medicine gets authorized in all EU countries at the same time. So it's uh, less time consuming than passing by every national competent authority. Um, one of the major advantages as well of this centralized uh, kind of procedure is that there is a centralized safety monitoring and especially for very rare safety events, this is kind of an advantage of course, because you're way uh, more likely to pick them up. Um, Product information um, gets um, available in all languages at the same time. And, and this is a thing that's very important for small member states, such as my own member state, Belgium is relatively small, that you at least have a large network of experts. So it's important, um, I think, for a regulatory body to be able to, to go to um, the expertise in the field and often small member states, imagine for example Luxembourg with 300,000 inhabitants, they can of course not have all this knowledge um, in-house and so it's better for them uh, to cooperate on the European level. On the next slide I'm mainly going to talk about the committee that I'm in as the Belgian representative. It's the Committee for Medicinal Products for uh, Human Use. It's the main scientific committee uh, that grants either a negative or positive opinion for marketing authorization to the European Commission. And all member states, as I already told you, are represented there by one member. So I'm the Belgian member, you have the French member, so there is one member for each member state, regardless of how large that member state is. Also meaning that, for example, Germany has the same uh, kind of uh, vote than uh, would, for example, have Luxembourg or Malta. So the 28 EU countries are present there. There are also five co-opted members, and these are members that are there because of specific expertise. This is not, um, um, this can be either a statistician or someone who has an expertise in quality. This also means, because these co-opted members also have the right to vote, that uh, when, as a member state, you have a co-opted member, you get two votes. And this is our case, for example, for Belgium. We have actually a an, an, uh, co-opted member as well. That's a pediatrician. And that is the liaison between CHMP and the pediatric uh, committee. So we have, as a relatively small state, two votes. And then, as I already told you, um, the EMA does the marketing authorization approval also for Norway and Iceland. These are kind of, and, and some people think that Great Britain might go that way, but I don't think they will ever agree to that. So Norway and Iceland, they want to have access to the common market within the EU. And they basically um, live by the rules of EMA. They sit in the meetings. They can also, uh, of course, give their opinion about the file, but they have no real vote. So they have a member 
but they have non-voting members. They have no, um, their vote is not taken into account. So what happens is, is that this committee conveys in, in London for now for three and a half days at the EMA office. And then all the products um, that um, are filing for marketing authorization um, and also products that are filing, for example, for an extension of the indication or for a new pharmaceutical form um, or discussed there, of course, a selection is made. Products that are very or variations uh, on indications that are very straightforward, um, we can sometimes agree not to discuss them and to go for silent adoption. The next slide shows the same as I've already told you. It's mandatory for new medicines in, in oncology, diabetes, advanced therapies, immunomodulating therapies, and orphan disease. And what CHMP basically needs to do on the next slide, you can see this, is the benefit risk assessment. So the basic question is, do the risk of a drug outweigh the benefit? This is the scientific question that the, that the commission wants to see answered. That means that we do not at all take into account what the pricing of the drug will be or anything else. We basically just look um, at the, the benefit risk ratio um, for uh, that new medicinal um, product. Um, in practice, what happens, and that's on the next slide. So, so when an applicant submits a marketing authorization to the EMA, um, they will first go to a, they have to prove that they have all the information necessary to go for a marketing authorization, that they are eligible to go for marketing authorization. But if they are approved, then what will happen is that two member states, and this is the chairman um, of the CHMP that's responsible for that, two member states will be assigned and we call it the rapporteur and the co-rapporteur to assess um, the new medicinal product in all its aspects. So going from quality to uh, the clinical study data to what should happen post-marketing, but that's in conjunction with the PRAC committee. So, and those two will independently um, have to make the benefit risk assessment for that drug. Uh, within a time frame of 210 days, or that can be accelerated to less, um, even accelerated procedure is granted, but I'll come back to that. So next slide, the rapporteurs write an assessment report. They then circulate that to all member states. The member states, they comment. Um, and what happens is that the based on these comments, the assessment report is adapted. Um, and if remaining issues for discussion remain. That's what we discuss in these uh, CHMP meetings. What happens next, and this is after um, 80 days for the first round, is that the list of questions, outstanding issues, is then sent back to the applicant. A clock stop um, then starts and the applicant responds during the clock stop and then the clock is restarted when the applicant actually submits the responses. The total assessment time is 210 days. In 150 days, when it's an accelerated uh, kind of procedure, excluding um, the clock stock. And in the end, the applicant also has the option to defend its application in front of um, the CHMP. It's what we call the oral explanation. So basically, if, if there is, for example, at the end discussion, and this is, of course, more often the case when uh, there is a tendency to go negative on a, on a new application, then um, the company will usually take this opportunity to, to uh, come and defend itself during an oral explanation. Um, next slide. Um, so the, it ends with a final vote, and that's what we call the opinion. That opinion goes to the European Commission. If a total of 17 votes is needed for a positive opinion, so this is logically because it's 28 plus the five co-opted members so it's more than half it's just a majority vote um, and if a, a vote goes negative an applicant can actually also ask for a re-examination now i have to say that in case a drug only gets a majority of 17 votes this is seen as something kind of problematic because um of the fact that uh, all other member states would then be obliged to, to allow a product on their market that they're not really in favor of. 
they can write a divergent opinion, but they still have to allow, uh, allow the drug on their market. What usually will be done is that, that the, we will then look for compromise to get a larger and more comfortable majority um, in order to avoid having too much divergent opinions and too much uh, tension. But I'll come uh, back to that as well. Now, the way we approve medicines in, in Europe, either we go for full approval, and that means that the benefit risk is, 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 is positive, but, and that uh, we are not expecting anything else from the company anymore except for normal, normal pharmacovigilance. But there's two other ways also um, to approve a product in Europe, and that's an approval under exceptional circumstances and a conditional um, approval. Now, what is important is that under all three kinds of approvals, there needs to be a positive benefit risk. So we are never going to really give a positive opinion to a drug where we cannot establish a positive benefit risk. In the case of exceptional circumstances, it's um, rarely the case, but it's diseases that are encountered so rarely that we cannot reasonably expect the, 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 the company to provide very comprehensive data. Um, so it's used in very, very rare diseases um, where um, you can really not ask uh, them to collect uh, more data in a clinical trial setting because, for example, of the large medical needs. Next is the conditional approval. That is uh, medicinal products for seriously debilitating disease or life-threatening diseases where there is a high unmet need. Or medicinal products, for example, to be used in emergency situations in response to public health threats. Um, as you can imagine, for example, an Ebola vaccine or, or something else uh, in, in case of bioterror could be considered uh, in those uh, circumstances. Or um, often medicinal products designated as orphan medical um, products. Um, there we can say, well, we are approving this, but we are wanting to you to gather more efficacy safety data um, in the coming years. And then we reassess whether the marketing authorization remains in place every year until we can finally grant full approval. Either, of course, if the data that are later gathered show that the benefit risk is not as positive as we assumed in the beginning, we can withdraw the marketing authorization um, um, if needed, although that, that rarely happens. Um, what happens next is that the European Commission adopts the CHMP recommendation and that then the company has marketing authorization for the entire EU, including Norway and Iceland. And then everything is written in a public assessment report that is subsequently translated in all national languages. Now, what is important is that normally the um, opinion in the, from the CHMP is approved by the Commission. It rarely gets sent back. But in case that one of the member states feel that they are negative about the product, where is it, it got a positive opinion by a majority vote and they can really not live with it, they can ask for a so-called standing committee in which the voting is not one member per member state, but in which the voting is weighed um, according to the number of inhabitants of member states. It happens rarely, but it does happen sometime. And so in this kind of, that can overrule the CHMP opinion, and then larger member states have um, more to um, say. Now I'm going to talk a bit about uh, my experiences within the system. So this is the room uh, which I know very well because it's very long meetings usually. Um, and um, the thing is that, as you can probably imagine, within CHMP, not all member states have the same kind of um, power. And so there are really kind of opinion makers and shapers in CHMP and until recently the UK and we talk about the big five the UK used to be one of those the UK had two votes because the statistician is also from uh, MHRA so from the UK regulatory body and uh, the UK uh, took almost 30 percent 
of all procedures are actually held by the UK. They have now been re redistributed to um, the other member states. But UK had a, it, it's going to be a huge knowledge gap when the UK is no longer in the system. The other one is Germany, obviously a very large uh, member state and uh, also economically uh, very powerful. Uh, Sweden is um, not, a, well, it's a large member state, but not in terms of inhabitants, but it has a very strong agency and uh, is actually also the current chair is Swedish. So it has a lot to say. The Netherlands also has a lot to say and Spain also has uh, two votes. And this big five are involved in many, many procedures, either as rapporteur or co-rapporteur, and they also comment on most of the procedures and are very active during the CHMP plenary discussion. So the, the show is kind of, they steal the show, if you want to call it that way. On the next slide, you I talk about the fact that there is also second tier countries. This is countries that are involved in some procedures, um, they often have to go for expertise into multinational teams. So, for example, quality will be assessed by Portugal, whereas the clinical site is done by another member state, it's as Belgium. They usually choose specific areas of expertise, and this is exactly what we have done as Belgium. So, um, because of the fact that we are a small member state, we have forced ourselves to um, kind of focus on a few fields. In, in our case, it's endocrinology, diabetes. This is because of the interest of the member, of course, but um, also um, vaccines. Um, this is because um, um, we have a, a very big tradition of vaccines, also having a, a major plan of GlaxoSmithKline on our territory and um, oncology. So, and most member states do that. Most smaller member states, they choose uh, a kind of, uh, field of expertise uh, that they want to specialize in and then they will comment on the procedures that are in that field of expertise but they will kind of remain silent when uh, when there's other products coming. Some member states are way more strict um, and I guess it's a cultural thing within Europe. They are put a higher bar for positive benefit risk and um, they are also always a bit wary about new initiatives so as the prime scheme, which tries to um, increase, I'm going to talk about that later as well, it tries to increase really the kind of interaction between um, the regulator and companies for priority medicines, so for medicines that, uh, that are considered to be of uh, major therapeutic uh, benefit uh, that you want to get to the market uh, quickly. Um, other member states are more um, pragmatic and, and they, they, they're going to be a bit less uh, bound by guidelines and they are going to be more prone to go for faster uh, kind of approvals. Now, you might think on a cultural basis that this would be a north-south divide, but that's not really the case. Um, there is northern countries that are extremely, uh, that I consider at least to be kind of pragmatic, such as, for example, Sweden is kind of a pragmatic member state, uh, whereas the southern countries, such as Italy, that are relatively hawkish. So it's um, it's kind of uh, sometimes unexpected uh, which member states are hawks uh, versus uh, doves. Then, um, and this is something that is of interest, I think, to maybe companies, how are decisions made within CHMP what is true is that the best way to predict the future decision of the European Medicine Agency is to look at the past. So there is a big emphasis on consistency in assessment. Um, so previous decisions have a major impact on future decisions. And um, when companies try to kind of force a completely different um, thing that will give lead to a lot of discussion and, and will be less um, straightforward. Um, this is the case for the SMPC wording, the wording of the indication, the type of approval, uh, also what is asked in the risk minimization um, measures, uh, post-marketing. So there, there is a kind of need for um, uh, consistency, and this is obviously because you want to treat everyone in the same way, but that also means that the past often predicts the future. Not always the case, because of course some fields really move and then we move along, but we will always try to be uh, kind of wary of being inconsistent because uh, 
and of course you get um, companies from other, uh, you get comments from other stakeholders. Then, as I already told you, we're rarely going to go um, for something um, that a lot of member states cannot accept. So even if 20 member states, and if you have a majority by vote, you will try to kind of find compromises by either restricting an indication or being tougher on the company in terms of post-marketing uh, surveillance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's a, it, it is something that is common in the European Union. We need to get along with uh, the 27 or 28 member states. And so we need to kind of compromise. Um, what's also typical is that the rapporteur really kind of said, oh, the rapporteur, so the rapporteur and the co-rap, they set the scene. Um, it's very rare that the rapporteur, for example, would be negative and that the outcome would still be positive. Um, mostly um, the rapporteur is followed or, or and it's tried to discuss to be more lenient. Uh, so it's the rapporteur and the big five that set the scene. And then the smaller member states um, in their field of expertise, they set the scene. So Belgium, for example, will be kind of uh, setting the scene in the field of diabetes or in the field of vaccines. What are trends um, in the CHMP during recent years? Um, and I think this is a trend that probably also uh, exists in the US, is that we have um, an increased flexibility in approval um, processes because we really have a fear of being perceived as more restrictive and slower than FDA. So there is a lot of emphasis on, on saying, well, you should, um, especially drugs that clearly have a benefit, they should not be kept from patients and you should assess them more quickly. You should become more efficient. So um, that has led a bit to acceptance of smaller and often less robust data sets. Um, and one of the, and this is also the main reason why we have started, for example, the prior, priority medicine and adaptive pathway kind of uh, ways of approval, which is like the aim is to get a drug um, faster um, to the patient, um, um, all because of um, pressure from uh, other stakeholders, but especially pressure from uh, um, patients. Um, now, on the next slide, you'll see that this is kind of um, problematic in one way, that there is a growing friction between, at the one hand, EMA, and at the other hand, the payers. And the payers, and this is probably a bit different in the US, but the payers are often the member states in Europe, because most European countries have a national security system in place. And so um, the, the payers are kind of the, 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 the national authorities. Um, and if CHMP gives a positive opinion, um, then often within the reimbursement agency of the national competent authorities, it might be felt, well, listen, we don't think the benefit risk is as positive as outlined, or, or we think there is more uncertainties, or we do not want to put our money there. Because of course, as I told you before, we don't take in account, we do the benefit risk assessment without taking into account the pricing of a drug. Um, and so some, you get some comments sometimes from from the reimbursement agencies within the eu from well it's all very easy to say yeah positive benefit risk but we are not um, able to put our wallet um, where is your talk so this is uh, kind of an increasing uh, a problem this is also a problem sometimes with trials we ask so i haven't talked about this before but um, companies can come to the ema to get scientific advice and then we advise them on how to design, for example, their clinical trials. Often, um, we want to see a trial conducted versus placebo to get a better feel of safety. But the HTAs, the, the payers, are often more interested to see the results against the comparator um, to see whether really um, it's that much better as a, a comparator. There are some initiatives to increase interaction between CHMP or EMA on the one hand and the reimbursement agencies on the other hand. But I have to say that this is very difficult because of course, um, the, as you can appreciate, uh, the financial possibilities of member states is uh, very variable across um, the EU. Also something that I think is also the case for FDA um, and this is something I think is not bad, but it's something that's sometimes difficult to manage, is that there is an increased focus on the patient's point of view. So more and more 
uh, patients are represented in uh, the scientific advice groups, etc. There is still no patient representation within the CHMP. Uh, at this mo moment, it would also be very difficult to do in view of the variety of products that pass there, but there is an increased focus on the, on the patient point of view. And for example, uh, on the fact that uh, if quality of life data are available, they might be included in 5.1 of the SPC, et cetera, et cetera. And there is an increased use also of uh, scientific advisory groups. This is one, um, basically, um, we feel that it's difficult for us to reach a final um, opinion about the benefit risk of a drug. We can gather um, a group um, of uh, experts um, uh, in the EMA offices to discuss it and to form um, our um, opinion more based on uh, their scientific knowledge. Um, what's also, and that's on the next slide, encouraged uh, through the PRIME scheme, but also through the scientific uh, advice scheme, is early and frequent interaction between, on the one hand, the drug developers, and on the other hand, the regulator. And this is all um, because it's also always very unfortunate when you realize at the time of marketing authorization that there is gaps in the file that is submitted. And in order to avoid that, um, EMA really seeks to kind of um, advise companies and encourages companies to seek advice early on. Now, as you can imagine, this is um, on the one hand very good, but on the other hand, it's sometimes, and I'll come back to that, gives the impression that we are kind of sleeping with the industry sometimes, but uh, of course we are not, but um, it's, uh, you, it's important that we remain kind of um, independent. Um, and then there is also an aim to increase the quality um, of the benefit risk assessment. Um, you can imagine that as a, as, a, as a file always goes to other member states and to other group of people um, assessing the file, it's important to kind of have a, 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 a good structure and always use the kind of same terminology in terms of benefit risk because otherwise other stakeholders um, get confused. So I think in Europe, we will rarely find people that uh, say that the previous system of um, decentralized procedures was better. I think everybody is happy with this harmonization, uh, the industry, uh, but also um, healthcare professionals. Why? Because we have one-stop shop for regulatory approval in Europe, so you don't have to go to all the different agencies. It's a relatively transparent and predictable system, at least in, time, in, in, in terms of um, timelines. Um, there is a possibility for applicants to appeal. There is a possibility for member states to appeal if they really can't agree through that standing committee. Um, and then there is also the fact that, um, and this is a, a big um, advantage, I think, that you can actually harmonize the guidelines for drug development um, within all these member states. If they would all have different kind of requirements, it would, of course, become hopeless. Now, it would even be better if, um, the big agencies throughout the world uh, would harmonize, but um, that's maybe a, a longer leap even. What are the weaknesses? I think the weaknesses are a bit the same as FDA. There is complaints that it's too slow, but then other, on other things, people say, well, you have approved this too fast. It all depends, of course, on your point of view. Um, and um, then there is a thing that, Probably conditional approval, adaptive pathways for approval have been kind of used. Um, some feel they have been used too liberally and that um, then you get in trouble when they need to be reimbursed because the reimbursement they just can find that the data set is not, um, not comprehensive enough. Uh, others say, well, you haven't used them enough um, um, and you should use them more. Um, that's kind of a weakness. Another weakness that on, on, on one of my last slides is the cost efficiency of the system. As you uh, and then another thing I already touched upon is that regulatory approval does not bring reimbursement. Um, um, and that's kind of a problem because if a drug is not reimbursed in Europe, it's rarely um, really successful uh, within the market. But I have to emphasize it does work. Um, and so that's it for me. And I suggest because I'm... Yeah, I've talked for 45 minutes that maybe um, I could um, um, answer some questions if you have any. 
Bart, thank you so much. That was a fascinating presentation.